I can't help but think that today might be a good day for a spontaneous lunch after church. You up for that? Uh, I noticed that you didn't bring lunches with you. So, oh no, I've got the plan. So I thought maybe what we could do is, is take up a collection and order in pizza. Okay? I know you weren't expecting this, but that's okay. I did a quick estimate though, and uh, for this lunch there'll be about 5,000 men whole bunch of women and children, so at eight slices per pizza, we'll need 2,000 pizzas. And we factor in the drink and the GST and inflation from the first century, we'll need about $45,000 in cash, right now, from your wallet. And we don't even have offering plates. How are we gonna pull this off? It's a little overwhelming, isn't it, to think of that kind of problem presenting itself. We're in a sermon series taken from the Gospel of John, and this is the exact situation of today's scripture. And we're not doing lunch afterwards, that was only an introduction, okay? I'm not asking for donations. The Gospel of John is about three quarters of the way through the Bible. Um, it's the fourth Gospel, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and it comes before Acts and Romans and the letters. And we'll begin to read at verse six. So I hope you have your Bibles with you and we can turn together to John chapter six. Sometime after this, the events that had happened before, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, and that is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they had seen the miraculous signs he had performed on the sick. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover feast was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, oh, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, it would take eight months wages, more than half a year's wages, to buy enough bread for each one just to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, um, spoke up. He said, here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go in this crowd among so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place and they sat down, about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to all those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to his disciples, gather the pieces that are left over, let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of the five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the people saw the miraculous sign Jesus performed, they began to say to one another, uh, surely this is the prophet that is to come into the world. And Jesus, knowing that they intended to make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. When evening came, his disciples went down to the lake where they got into a boat and set out across the lake to, for Capernaum. But by now it was dark and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, the waters grew rough, and when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water, and they were frightened, terrified. But he said to them, it is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. John, the writer of this gospel, is Jewish. But he also knows that he is writing a gospel that the Romans will read. 
And that's why he calls the sea the Sea of Galilee. That's the Jewish name. And the Sea of Tiberias. That's the Roman name. They had renamed it. Monuments get renamed after different people different times. And they had renamed it the lake. But there's a lesson for us in this. It's not the major lesson of the passage, but there is a lesson for us in this. If we speak of Jesus to those who are non-followers, non-believers, should we not use their language, things they understand? So John adjusted his words, his logic, his presentation in order to have the greatest impact on them. We have a map. Can we look at the map for a minute? Just so we know what we're dealing with here. Um, Capernaum is right up there. The Seda is right over here. It's probably in this area over here that uh, this event happened. And uh, Tiberius, for which the, had been renamed and the lake is there, um, is down over here. And the Sea of Galilee is not that large. Across the lake is about eight kilometers, five miles. And from north to south, the Jordan River runs down in here. And from north to south is about um, 13 kilometers, about eight miles. It's about the size of Sylvan Lake, if Sylvan Lake were this shape. Sylvan Lake isn't that shape. But that's about the size of things we're dealing with here today. And Capernaum, Capernaum is on the west side over here. If you go north up and around, you'll find Bethesda and, and that whole area. You, you get the picture. Now, what's interesting is that Philip is from Bethesda. Or Bethesda, Bethsaida, sorry. Philip is from Bethsaida. And we learned that in John 1, So is Andrew and Peter. And so it's in his home territory. So Jesus sees the crowd coming towards him, and of course you'd ask the local guy, Philip, you're from around here, how can we feed these people? Is there a Pizza Hut takeout available? How about a subway? How can we feed these people? Philip had the logical response. Well, in the past, when we've had weddings and funerals, those would be big events, uh, it's gone like this. Uh, we go down to the baker and we buy bread, and we go down to the dock and we buy fish, and uh, we purchase all these things, we put them together into a meal, and uh, let's see, we have about 5,000 men, we have women and children, carry the one, do the math, uh, one meal, fish on a bun with bottled water, $45,000. Eight months wages, 200 denarii. And since we really have no fixed address, we're a roving band, um, the bank isn't gonna extend a loan to us in this. So Judas, how much is, the money, uh, is in the money purse? Have you got, are you packing 45,000 in there today? That's quite a conundrum, isn't it? Logically, it is impossible. There is no way to feed these people. It can't happen. End of discussion. And Andrew comes along with a small boy, and he'd like to help. In fact, he gives everything he has, his whole lunch. Five Timbits, two sardines. It's not much, is it? But his heart is in it. The boy had simple faith simple innocence. He didn't know his lunch was too small. It was enough for him. He didn't know how big the problem was. But he gave it. He gave what he had. Sidney Harris has created a cartoon that I think will help explain this. It's not built for this, for this passage, but here it comes. If you can read in the middle there, uh, at the bottom it says, right, oops, I can, I can do this. Where'd it go? <laughs> Did I do that? Right in the middle here, you see this whole math equation, and then right in the middle it says, then a miracle occurs. And this caption says, I think you should be a little more explicit about this, this step two. Then a miracle occurs. 
See, Philip was able to define the problem, but he had no resolution. The boy had no idea of the magnitude of the problem, but he did what he could. Jesus took the bread, barley, buns, small loaves. They didn't have any, they didn't have the word Timbits back then. And he gave thanks to God the Father and distributed it. And not just a little bit. When they were done, there were 12 baskets of bread left over. An amazingly generous miracle. There is no other explanation. A miraculous sign. It's Mother's Day and we think sometimes about our interaction with, my, with mothers and, and I wonder what happened to that boy when he went home. Mom says, how was your day? And the boy tells you what happened. Well, I gave my lunch to Andrew. Andrew gave it to Jesus, and you gave it to Jesus, and they fed 5,000 with it. And mom says, I've told you how many times not to lie and exaggerate. <laughs> you go to your room until you can repent of this. But mom, this really happened. It's hard to believe, isn't it? As we tell the story, it's hard to believe. I wish I had that kind of faith and that kind of trust as a little boy. Here, Jesus, this is what I have. It's not much. It really isn't much. But I give it to you. Do your will with this. It may not be Timbits and sardines. Lord, you've given me a gift of music. Do what you will with this. You've given me the ability to talk to strangers. Do what you will with this. You've given me the ability to fix things. Do what you will with this. I'm too much like Philip. Boy, do we have a problem. And these people are going to get hungry and upset. Hangry. And then we're going to have a mob on our hands. I've been in that situation. Kind of. April 5th, 1997, uh, we lived in Manitoba and we had um, what is known, now known as the worst uh, ice and snowstorm ever in Manitoba's history. We didn't cause it, it just happened. And they ended up closing the main highway that runs past this our little town of Emerson. Emerson is a town of 700 people. And on that uh, night, Saturday night and Sunday night, we had 400 extra people stranded in a town of 700. Uh, there was one hotel with nine rooms. What are you going to do? And I was kind of in the middle of it, as I tended to get myself into things. They said, be the emergency social services coordinator for the area, Fred. That's, it's a nice position. You don't ever have to do anything. You know, nothing ever happens. So you'll be fine. What do you do with 400 people? So we quickly assembled a team and started phoning people who had extra beds and even space on the floor. So it became an interesting situation. Uh, for instance, Marge Balderson, lovely lady, she was the organist at the Anglican Church. Um, she had been a longtime widow, an older lady, a very modest house. Uh, a loaf of bread would last her a couple of weeks easy. Uh, and so uh, one of our team phoned Marge and said, can you, can you help us out? We know you have, see that's living in the small town, we knew how many bedrooms everybody had. <laughs> Can you help us out? She took two families. That loaf of bread didn't last that long. There's an act of faith on her part. Just come and we'll use whatever we have. We did manage to get the store open and deliver stuff. We used snowmobiles to deliver from the store to her house. But like Marge, that boy did what that boy did in our passage was very special. Have you ever had a gift from a child? This is Mother's Day again. Have you ever had a gift from a child that's really special? I have. Forgive me for crying. 
in the mid 1980s, back then we were a young couple with small children and the government stopped building schools and hospitals and this construction industry grew increasingly stressful and there was too much supply chasing too few jobs, too little demand and the red ink was flowing. So you can buy hail insurance and drought insurance and that kind of fire insurance, but you can't buy recession insurance. And we were responsible not only for ourselves, but five or six, seven families where the, we employed the primary breadwinner and that weighed heavy. And then a major contractor went bankrupt. Our daughters, Trisha and Candace were little girls and they caught wind of this. They knew daddy was anxious and upset and didn't know what to do. So Trisha, more because she was the older one, went to her toy collection, and gave me blocks of wood. She knew I built with wood. Here, Daddy, can you use these? Build something that you can sell? That's not the amazing part. The amazing part that is 40 years later, I still carry them. Because they're precious. They're precious to me. I wonder. I wonder if that's how God views the little gifts we give him. He holds them. He says, they're precious to me. He treasures them. I wonder if in God's treasure chest of things, we'll find five timbits and two sardines. And because it's heaven, they won't smell yet. So back to the scripture passage. There's a tremendous problem. And the gift of a boy's lunch and Jesus giving thanks solved the problem. But it created another problem. Because now the people saw the miraculous sign with the food and so now they wanted to stage a revolution. They wanted to move Jesus into being a political re leader. Jesus, you're so good at this, now lead us. And we'll find out next week they went on some other things too. And that fit the ethos of the day, the culture of the day. Solve the political problem and life will be easy. Having political leaders who have godly character and a servant attitude is better than the alternative. But politics isn't going to solve the heart issue. And I find it really sad when even today people use Jesus for political ends. Because he wants our heart. And he treasures what we give him. And so will we love him? Will we believe in him? Will we follow him or will we demand, as these people did, Jesus, you must do it our way. You must be do it our way. Fit our mold. In the passage we read, Jesus twice clearly demonstrates that he is God. He is divine. He is the supra-natural, outside of time and space. He takes that little lunch and he feeds 5,000. And I think the next part is John wrote just for Canadians because Jesus walks on the water. Six months a year, we walk on water. <laughs> Maybe that's why it says there was a storm coming up. See, around the whole Sea of Galilee, um, it's, it's mountainous, it's or hilly. We have to define mountain. Picture, picture the, you're at the bottom of Canyon Ski Hill. Okay, that kind of a hill, not a mountain like we think of Banff. But that's what they had, so they called them mountains. And this storm came up and it swirled around inside that, that bowl and the waters were rough and stormy and Jesus walked out on the water when it was fluid, not when it was frozen. 
and the disciples were trying to row across the lake, they saw the wind and the waves and they saw Jesus and they were frightened. I'd be frightened too if somebody walked out on the water in that situation. It's a miracle. No trickery. He didn't have little balloons on his feet or a jet ski underneath him or whatever the jetpack things. He simply walked out to them and comforted them. So we have two major events that demonstrate that Jesus is God, that he's divine. And we can respond to that. We will respond to that. We have three responses, really, or kind of, we'll call them three. We can be like that little boy and say, here you go. Here's what I have. It's yours, Jesus. If you choose to multiply it, so be it. It's yours, Jesus. A gift given wholly from the heart without expectation, that which is treasured is now yours. Or we can be like the crowd and we can attempt to use Jesus and his power for our sake, for what we want. Roger Fredrickson in his communicator's commentary says, Jesus came to call men to a radical, costly discipleship, not to a kingdom of bread. He will be king only of those who surrender by the narrow door of spiritual surrender. Will we surrender to Jesus? And the third one, have you ever face a problem that's too big? too ginormous, we don't have the resources to take care of it. Maybe this passage teaches us that that's the time that we hand it over to Jesus because it's not too big for him. It's not too big for him. Feeding 5,000 or maybe 10,000 if you count all the women and children, nothing for him. Walking on water, calming the storm, not too big for him. Redeeming me, a sinner, not too big for him. Redeeming you, one who is a strange from God, not too big for him. He's God, God Almighty, and we are not. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us Jesus. So we celebrated earlier with the elements of communion, Lord. We, we just thank you for loving us so much, for redeeming and restoring and not leaving us there, but moving us to be holy. And Lord, thank you that you are powerful enough to do it. Lord, we honor you and we worship you and we offer back even our little toys that you might treasure them and use them for your glory and for your honor. In your name we pray, amen. For those of you who have your Bibles, could you please turn to Ephesians 5, verse 25. This is a scripture text that I don't know how many times I've read that. Probably hundreds. Um, but it made a big impact on me about nine years ago at a men's conference. Ephesians 5, oh, it's on the Screen. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church 
and gave himself up for her. The first church speaker, David McLean, went and spoke about this text in a way that I had never heard before. And uh, when he asked us, Brothers, do you love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her? It hit me like a ten-ton truck. Um, for the record, I love my wife. But I know I have a long way to go, and maybe you do too. Um, but eventually, it dawned on me that if every husband in the church took that verse to heart, we would transform this, the church, the world. We probably wouldn't need to run counseling services anymore. Um, I want to give a heartfelt thanks to all you wives out there for your patience and long sufferings, forbearance um, from all of us husbands who might not be quite getting it right. Most of us are really trying, even if it doesn't quite seem like it sometimes. When I come to the Lord's table, I often feel like I'm not quite prepared. Um, not like I would prefer. Today, I'm hoping that we can participate in this remembrance with a clear grasp of what Christ did for us, his church, his body, and the gratitude that is due him. I'd like us now to look at verses 25, 26, and 27. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the blood, through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain, wrinkle, or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. The Apostle Paul uses uh, at least five verbs to indicate Christ's commitment to perfecting his bride, the church. First, the word he uses for love is agape, the Greek word for a remarkable, self-sacrificing, I'm willing to die for you kind of love. Christ, the heavenly bridegroom, loved his bride, the church. This seems to refer to his eternal pre-existence in which he set his love on his people and determined to come and save them. So, having loved the church, he then gave himself up for her, the second verb. Thirdly, the purpose for his sacrifice was to make her holy, to sanctify her, and yes, by cleansing her through washing with water through the word. The water is a reference to baptism, and the word likely a public profession of faith. Finally, he will present her to himself an allusion to Christ's return in glory and honor, and the completion of his bride's preparation. She will be, and we will be, radiant, without stain or wrinkle or blemish. We will be holy and blameless. What a glorious day that will be for us in the body of Christ, the church, his bride. Hallelujah. If the service should come forward. Christ's substitutionary death on the cross as a payment for our sins is available to each and every sinner who admits their need for a savior. 
If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that, mouth that Christ is Savior and Lord, we encourage you to participate in this communion. If that's not where you're at, we're glad you're here. And please pass the trays on. Servers will be distributing gluten-free bread followed by grape juice, which you may consume whenever you are ready. Finally, the baskets will be circulated to retrieve the empty cups. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for your unfailing love and your commitment to your bride, the church. Thank you that you gave yourself up for her, for us, by sacrificing your body on the cross. In your own name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. To the Lord, we thank you that your blood was a satisfactory payment for the sins of many, even to those who call upon your name. We thank you for the future hope that we have. May your name be exalted now and always in Jesus' name. Amen.